Uh, thank you, Lauren. And um, yeah, it's a real pleasure to be here in the symposium um, and, and here in Madison for this meeting. Um, so I'm going to talk today about a model of mutation selection balance for complex diseases. But I want to begin on more familiar ground with a model I imagine you've all seen before. Uh, and that's the single locus mutation selection balance model for an allele that causes disease in heterozygous form. Now in this model, which I'm presenting in a fairly simplified form here, uh, we imagine a single gene producing disease alleles at rate mu, and this mutational pressure has to be balanced by the selection response, which is just given by the genetic variance times the selection coefficient. And if the disease is fully penetrant, then the selection coefficient is just the fitness cost of the disease. Now, if selection is strong, the frequency of the disease allele is approximately zero, or very close to it, I should say, which allows us to ignore this 1 minus q term. And then we can simply divide the selection coefficient over to get the equilibrium frequency. Right? And so this expression highlights a simple property of the one locus model, which is that the frequency of a disease allele is highly sensitive to the fitness cost of disease. If we dramatically decrease the cost of disease, then we expect a corresponding increase in the frequency of the disease allele and vice versa. Now, of course, it became clear as soon as the first per gene mutation rate estimates became available that this model is insufficient in many cases. Um, so as Gottsman and Shields pointed out while writing about schizophrenia in 1967, it's just implausible that a, a disease with a, a prevalence of nearly 1% could be maintained by mutational pressure alone at a single gene. And this, along with the fact that many diseases don't segregate within families according to anything resembling Mendelian ratios, led them and many of their contemporaries to su suggest that there may be a polygenic mode of inheritance. And of course, they were right about this. Um, consider, for example, this paper from Poe Rouleau and colleagues, which estimated that somewhere between 71 and 100 percent of all one megabase blocks in the human genome make a non-zero contribution to the heritability of schizophrenia. And while I think schizophrenia may be a particularly extreme example, it, nonetheless, uh, it is nonetheless the case that for many diseases, um, the, the genetic variation and disease risk can be uh, explained by uh, a significant contribution from a very large number of alleles, which each make very small contributions to, to variation and disease risk on their own. And so I'd like to suggest that we can think about at least some of these highly polygenic diseases in terms of a generalized model of mutation selection balance. And to that end, we can start from the way in which complex diseases are modeled in human genetics, which is often with something called the liability threshold model. Now, the basic idea of the threshold model is that we posit some underlying, unobserved, continuous variant called liability, and each individual's liability derives from a combination of genetic and environmental factors, which all combine additively. Individuals with the liability above some threshold get the disease, while those below the threshold are healthy. And this model has a long history in human genetics and is commonly used to estimate the heritability of complex diseases. Now, we can turn this into an evolutionary model with just a few additional assumptions. Namely, we assume that there's a, a, a mutational bias which pushes the population towards the threshold by a small amount every generation, and that this is balanced by a selection response due to the decreased evolutionary fitness of those individuals uh, past the threshold who get the disease. And as long as the disease is sufficiently polygenic, these forces will dominate drift at the level of the phenotype, and the disease prevalence will remain approximately constant, so long as nothing in the environment changes. Now, in order to understand the genetic architecture of disease under, the, uh, under this model, we need to get a handle on what the selection coefficients of individual alleles are. So to do this, let's zoom in on the threshold region and consider that a mutation of effect size alpha pushes an additional subset of the population across the threshold, corresponding to this purple area under the curve. So this area, therefore, gives the difference in the probability of developing the disease between the carriers of the two different alleles. So this I'm going to refer to as the risk scale effect size. And the selection coefficient in allele experiences is given simply by multiplying the effect size on this scale times the fitness cost of the disease, which gives us the average difference in fitness between, individual, between individuals carrying the two different alleles. Now, once mutation selection balance is established, individual sites will settle down into a sort of dynamic equilibrium where each site's selection coefficient determines its behavior. And we can divide the long-term evolutionary behavior of individual sites up into roughly three regimes. When the product of the effective population size and the selection coefficient is much, much less than one, drift dominates selection at the level of the individual site, and these alleles evolve as if effectively neutral. This means that they're able to fix in either direction. And so we should expect that over long time scales, we should come to a state where there should be a roughly equal number of, of um, sites fixed for the protective allele as sites fixed for the risk increase in allele, and therefore there should be an equal number of mutations toward protective and toward risk alleles in either direction. So as a class, these sets, this set of sites 
contributes to the variance in disease risk, and therefore the selection response, but they don't contribute to the mutational bias. On the other extreme, when 2NS is much, much greater than 1, selection overwhelms drift. Risk increase in alleles are incapable of fixing, and so there should be no sites capable of producing protective mutations, because all sites are fixed for the protective mutation already. These sites, therefore, uh, contribute both to the genetic variance and the selection response, but also to the mutational pressure. And then sites in the, the uh, intermediate regime have sort of intermediate behavior. Now, as an example of how this theory can be applied, I want to pose the question of whether or not the genetic architecture of schizophrenia, as uncovered by GWA so far, is at least qualitatively consistent with long-term mutation selection balance. Um, so here I'm showing you the distribution of risk scale effect sizes for genome-wide significant mutations identified in the GWAS for schizophrenia, assuming that the long-term ancestral prevalence of the disease was equal to the modern prevalence in Western environments of about 1%. Positive effects are cases where the derived allele increases risk, while negative effects represent cases where the derived allele is protective. Now, the fact that we see both risk-increasing and protective derived mutations suggests that we must be somewhere over in this, uh, you know, sort of effectively neutral regime over here, where mutations are able to fix in either direction rather freely, or else we would have no sites capable of producing these derived protective mutations. However, if we assume a reasonable, uh, reasonable based on the literature estimates, uh, fitness cost of about 50% and a long-term effective population size of about 10,000, that puts the population scaled selection coefficients, uh, the product of, of 2NE and S, in this range of 5 to 15, which is inconsistent with this observation that we have an equal number of protective and risk mutations segregating in the population. Um, however, note that the risk scale effect size and therefore the selection coefficients clearly depend on the prevalence of the disease. Uh, if the ancestral prevalence of the disease was considerably lower, then the effect on risk, the purple area under this curve here, uh, would have been lower. And therefore, the selection coefficients would be lower as well. So, for example, if we suppose that the ancestral disease prevalence was around five hundredths of a percent, this puts us more in the regime where drift is on equal footing with selection and makes it plausible that a substantial number of sites in this effect size range could be fixed for the liability increasing allele and therefore. Uh, capable of producing derived protective mutations. Okay, so now this brings me to the second half of my talk where I want to drill down a bit further to understand how changes in the environment impact the mutation selection balance dynamic and therefore the genetic architecture over the long term. I just told you about how the selection coefficients of individual alleles depend on the prevalence via the risk scale effect size, and I also told you how the balance between mutation and selection dominates drift at the level of the liability phenotype, holding the prevalence constant over the long term. However, in my attempt to reconcile the genetic architecture of schizophrenia with the modern prevalence and fitness cost, I invoked a recent increase in prevalence that was non-genetic in origin. So this could be accomplished, we could, we could model this, for example, by a change in the mean of the environmental component of liability, which pushes a larger proportion of the population over the threshold, driving the risk scale effect sizes up, and therefore the selection coefficients as well. Now, this means that we must now be out of equilibrium, with the selection response outweighing the mutational pressure. So clearly we're going to have an evolutionary response, which will restore the population to mutation selection balance. So how does this play out? Well, in order to get a sense of this, we can rely on an approximation from quantitative genetics, which says that the selection response should be equal to the product of the additive genetic variance for liability multiplied by the selection gradient, which is the derivative of log mean fitness with respect to mean liability. So, to simplify, VA tells us about the population's capacity to respond to selection, whereas beta, the selection gradient, tells us about the strength of selection. So we can further unpack the selection gradient term by recognizing that the form of selection under the liability threshold model is very similar to truncation selection. Under truncation selection, we also have a threshold, but all individuals on one side of the threshold are simply removed from the population, giving them a fitness of zero. And when only a small proportion of the population is truncated, the selection gradient under truncation selection is equal to the height of the normal density function at the truncation point, which I'm writing as phi of t here. Now, in our case, when the individuals past the threshold are not eliminated from the population, but merely experience some reduction in fitness, the selection, the selection gradient generalizes as the product of phi of t times the fitness cost of the disease, capital S. And so if, if the disease was lethal, S would be 1, and this gets us back to this truncation selection gradient. Um, okay, now in making this approximation, we've implicitly made an assumption 
about the selection coefficients as well, so I want to be explicit about that. And in particular, the quantitative genetic approximation implies an assumption that the risk scale effect size can be approximated as the product of the liability scale effect size alpha times this phi of t thing, which is the height of the normal density at the threshold point. And so this is a good approximation as long as most of the variance comes from sites with small effect sizes. Okay, so returning to the main thread here, now we've just increased the prevalence of the disease via a shift in the environmental component of liability. We're going to have an evolutionary response in order to restore mutation selection balance. That response is carried out via many small shifts in allele frequency spread across a very large number of sites, which means that the equilibrium can be restored with negligible change to either the mutational bias or the additive genetic variance. And because we're also assuming that the fitness cost remains constant, uh, restoration of mutation selection balance simply involves restoring 5T to the value that it had before the environmental change. In other words, the population re-evolves the same prevalence that it had before the environmental change. Uh, the genetic architecture of highly polygenic disease at mutation selection balance should there be, therefore be insensitive over the long term to uh, environmental perturbations of the prevalence, because the population always evolves back to the same prevalence that it had before the environment changed, restoring the same distribution of selection coefficients. Now, perhaps that's not super surprising, but I want to close with, uh, by sharing a related result, which I did find surprising when I first stumbled across it, and which I think is somewhat non-intuitive, and that is that the selection coefficients, and therefore the genetic architecture, are also insensitive to changes in the fitness cost of the disease. So to see why, suppose we abruptly increase the cost of the disease rather than modifying the environmental component of liability. Again, we've now thrown the population out of mutation selection balance, and there's going to be an evolutionary response to restore it. But again, the response is carried out by many small changes in allele frequency across a large number of sites. Both the mutational pressure and the additive genetic variance stay approximately constant, and so restoring mutation selection balance therefore means that we have to reduce the prevalence such that the product of phi of t and s, this compound parameter, the selection gradient, um, is this, reaches the same value as it had before the change in the fitness cost. So notice that under our small effect size approximation uh, for the selection coefficient here, the fact that the product of these two things remains constant means that the selection coefficients have to remain constant as well. So um, this means that the Essentially, the genetic architecture of complex diseases should also be essentially insensitive to um, changes in the fitness cost of the disease. So just to show you how this plays out, here I'm showing the evolution of, a, of disease prevalence and population scale selection coefficient for a disease that starts with a prevalence of 1% and an allele that starts with a population scale selection coefficient of 1. Then after 200 generations steady at mutation selection balance, I abruptly increase the fitness cost from 20% to 80%. Initially, this causes a sharp increase in the selection coefficient, but the prevalence is reduced over a relatively small number of generations, um, which brings the selection coefficient back down to where it was before the change. This response is extremely fast when the heritability of the disease is high, but even with a heritability of 20%, the selection coefficients get most of the way back to their original values within just a few hundred generations. Um, Okay, so if you take three things away from this talk, I guess I'd like them to be these. Um, one, complex diseases should rapidly restore mutation selection balance after perturbations in the environment, and they do so by a rapid evolutionary change of the prevalence. Um, two, the genetic architecture of complex disease is, on its own, not informative about the fitness cost of the disease, as they're related only via this compound parameter of the prevalence. And third, what this implies is that the genetic architecture under this model is largely a reflection of the total strength of mutational bias towards increased disease risk, because that's what sets the strength of selection that needs to balance it. And it also depends on the underlying distribution of effects from newly arising mutations, which is a sort of fundamental biological thing that I think we'd all like to understand. Um, and so that, what, what's sort of interesting about that is that that's uh, qualitatively different from what you expect, for example, uh, for a model of a quantitative trait under stabilizing selection where the strength of selection really matters for what the genetic architecture looks like. Okay, so with that, I'll just, uh, I want to acknowledge in particular uh, my three uh, sort of mentors and advisors over the last couple of years, uh, Guy, Molly, and Graham, in particular Guy, who's my collaborator on this work, uh, as well as two talented graduate students in, in Guy's lab, uh, Laura and Yuval, who I've spent a bunch of time talking to, about uh, talking about evolutionary quantitative genetics with, and I've learned a ton from. Um, Columbia University gives me a place to sit, and NIH pays my salary, and I'm happy to take questions.